Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, we continue talking about basic concepts uh, of physics. And uh, today's basic concept is the time. Now, this course is presented on unizor.com. It's called Physics for Teens. I do recommend you to watch it from this website rather than from any other source because the website contains uh, not only the uh, link to this lecture, which is actually stored on, uni on YouTube, but also it contains notes and uh, um, it, it contains exams. Uh, also, uh, there is a course of math for teens, um, rather complete, I would say, and uh, above and beyond the site is completely free and doesn't have any advertisement. All right, so we are talking about time. Well, um, if you have uh, started the Math for, teen, for Teens course on this website, um, you remember that there are certain concepts uh, in mathematics which we just don't define. Basically, we are taking them as undefined. Well, if you have a theorem, you can um, uh, prove it based on another theorem or that other theorem based on even earlier theor theorem and then all the way uh, to the axioms. In geometry it's very obvious. Uh, for instance, in classical geometry you have uh, five uh, postulates of uh, Euclid's, Euclidus and from there we basically build the whole building of geometry. And axioms we're just taking um, without any proof uh, not because we like it, just because there is no other choice, right? Now, same thing when we define certain objects. Again, back to geometry, we define a triangle, for instance, as a uh, geometrical figure which basically contains three connected to each other um, segments. And segment is actually part of the line. And what is line? Line is undefined, as well as the point, as well as a plane, for instance. So there are certain undefined entities which are only used to build other uh, more complicated um, entities. Now, how can we uh, study these undefined entities? By uh, specifying their properties. So the point itself, for instance, in geometry is not really defined. You cannot really say, okay, this is the point or explain basically what is the point. No, you cannot do this. However, the point has properties which we have kind of postulate basically. We are axiomatized the properties. And then we can learn everything about an object we call the point by basically studying its properties. Same thing exactly with basic concepts of physics. Uh, concepts like uh, uh, time, for instance, which we are going to discuss today, or the concept of a space, for instance. So, um, time is an undefined entity in, in physics. However, as many other undefined entities, we are attributing certain properties, and it's the properties which we are actually studying, calling this a studying of time, right? So, we will concentrate on properties of the time. So, I will try to explain how we measure time, how we count, etc., etc. Um, but again, these are properties of the time. I don't know what the time is. Well, in as much as I don't know what the point actually is. But I do know the properties. And that's the properties which is important. So, let's talk about time in uh, the language of its properties. Well, first of all, um, as an explanatory statement, time is a form of existence of our world. I mean, it has many different forms, including spatial forms, for instance. And the time is also just one of the forms of existence. I understand it's not a definition of time, it's just certain descriptive language. Now, what is important is that everything in this world is basically changing. So we are observing certain processes which are happening in this world. And here is very, very important characteristic of time. 
any change in the process, any process, is related to change of time. And vice versa, if you have a change of time, then it necessitates certain change in the processes which are surrounding us. What it actually means that we can identify the time or actually the process of time, the going of the time, with certain process which we consider as a good measure uh, as far as reliability, uh, periodicity, uh, stability, predictability and other nice features. So we can always say that whatever we can call this type of predictable, stable, repetitive, etc. process, we call actually this process as a good equivalent of the time. So we don't know what the time is, but we can actually connect the going of the time uh, with certain process which we all agree upon as being a representation of the time. So, how can time be represented? I have already spoken about this in the previous, one of the previous lectures, that for instance, the rotation of the Earth around its uh, axis can be considered as a good representation of time. Why? Well, because it's relatively stable, or at least we think it is stable, uh, it's periodic, it's repetitive, it's uh, predictable. So all these properties of the time which we would like it to have, they can be represented by this rotation of the Earth. And that's exactly what people long, long time ago have decided to do. They say, okay, whatever the time is, we can measure it by uh, comparing with rotation of the Earth because we have day and night, day and night, and we can always say that uh, we have uh, uh, one rotation, they have divided into 24 hours, every hour into 60 minutes, every minute into 60 seconds, and they're saying, okay, now we can measure the time, because we know what is one unit of time. All we had to do is to say, okay, this moment of time is the beginning of time, and then measure every, let's say, second, um, uh, how much time has passed, or we can go backwards um, with certain number of seconds which precede our uh, conditional beginning of the time. It's not the beginning of the time, it's just some point which we have decided as the null point, all right? And from, the, fr from that point we go forward or backward. Okay, that's fine. This is definitely a good measure of the time and the rotation of the earth is a good representation of time um, and uh, and then from there people have built uh, certain other representations of the time which we usually call clocks or watches whatever and they all work fine they can be synchronized if they are slightly off each other um, and well basically that's exactly the way how the concept of time uh, was ingrained into our culture, into our science, and in everything, whatever we are doing, basically. That's why it's so universal. Well, the only thing is, um, the uh, rotation of the Earth must be measured somehow, right? So how people did it? Well, they probably used a telescope, which was fixed at certain position on the surface of the Earth. They pointed it to the sky, they saw some kind of a star, and then, as the Earth rotates, this star obviously uh, leaves this point of view of the telescope, and then when it goes uh, the full circle, the star again is in the same place in the same telescope. Well, that's good enough. So this is the period which we have divided, or they have divided, into 24 hours, um, and that was fine. Obviously, for uh, contemporary needs, this precision is definitely not sufficient. First of all, the stars are not really uh, at the same place all the time. They are moving, although very, very uh, slowly. And um, uh, the Earth is not exactly um, uh, rotating uh, at the same speed uh, in certain very precise terms. So there are different um, 
uh, variations within certain limits, of course, etc. But anyway, for contemporary measures, for contemporary science, uh, we are using uh, a different technology, contemporary technology. Well, uh, one of the most precise instruments uh, which we are using right now is called atomic clock. Um, basically, uh, I'm not really sure how exactly it's, it's working, but the idea is that certain atoms, in this particular case, uh, they're using atoms of cesium, the recession uh, element. Um, they have different states, energy states or something, and they are um, uh, oscillating between two different uh, states very, very fast. Um, and certain number of these oscillations occur in a second. Now, they have decided to, dis to, de to define an interval of time which is equal to one second, to certain number of oscillations, because uh, it's considered that these oscillations are much more precise than anything else which we can deal with. So oscillations are really very fast, occurring very fast, and uh, somewhere I have a number. Yeah, the number is nine billion one ninety two million six thirty one thousand seven hundred and seventy oscillations the period of time during which this number of oscillation uh, oscillations within this uh, within this atom are happening this is called one second uh, by definition so this is the definition of a second in a certain system of units we have an international system of units SI system internationale I think it's French so this international system of units basically declares that the period of one second is not really uh, related to rotation of the Earth, it's related to certain number of oscillations within the atoms of the cesium. Fine, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. There is a definition of a second. We all understand that the second is actually a relatively short period of time, and that's how we measure the time. Now, we are talking about certain very important two axioms about the time. Now, the first axiom is continuity of time. Well, we know that we have an interval of one second. How about half a second, or one thousandth of a second, or one millionth of a second? Do these intervals actually exist? Can I divide an interval of time into certain number sub-intervals and still get the certain valid time interval? Well, the answer is yes. So, by definition, uh, we just postulate, basically, that time is continuous, which means that any real number uh, which represents, I mean, any real number can represent certain number of um, seconds, for instance, like 3.5161, blah, 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 to whatever extent I want, of seconds, we assume that this is a valid interval of time. So time changes in a continuous fashion. Now, this is not exactly what contemporary quantum mechanics actually say, says, but we are not talking about contemporary quantum mechanics. We're talking about classical Newtonian mechanics, which was started in whatever, 17th century or whatever. And um, we assume as as an axiom that the time is continuous. The continuity of time is very important. So that's very important first axiom, which means we can divide any interval of time into any number of uh, sub-intervals. So that's how we have milliseconds, which are thousands of a second. We have microseconds, we have, uh, which is one millionth of a second. We have nanoseconds, picoseconds, etc., etc. So, however small intervals we want, we consider that these are existing time intervals, however small, infinitesimally small, basically, because we're talking about continuous, which means all real numbers can represent certain amount, certain number of seconds, and certain time interval. The second axiom. Second axiom is related to the following fact. 
For instance, you have conducted an experiment right now, today, and it has certain result. Now, what this axiom states that if you are able to duplicate completely conditions of your exp experiment tomorrow, it should produce exactly the same results. So, the same experiment, identical experiment, at two different moments of time, or two different intervals of time, should produce exactly the same results. It's called uniformity of time. Time changing does not really change the outcome of any experiment, of any physical process. So, all modifications of physical process are related to some, maybe, modifications in the condition, in the environment of the experiment. But if the experiment is completely identical to another one performed at another uh, moment in time, the results must be the same. So that's uniformity. So we have continuity, continuity, and we have uniformity of time. These are two very, very important properties of time. I mean, I told you in the very beginning, we're talking about properties. So these are properties. And obviously we can measure the time using atomic clock with certain number of oscillations to be equal to one particular unit. And so we can actually do anything we want with the time. And in particular, we can use the time uh, as an argument to three very important coordinate functions which we were discussing before. Now I can say that t is a real time, it's a real number, which is a, a, a numerical characteristics of the interval passed from the beginning of time. So I have to have somewhere a moment of time where the time is equal to zero, and then I can say that after a certain number of seconds measured by this parameter t, my uh, 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 physical object, which is actually a point, uh, has these coordinates in the space. We are talking about Cartesian coordinates right now. So that's th so this way, the concept of time as a real number which represents certain number of seconds from certain conditional beginning of the time, that allows us to basically quantitatively address the position of uh, our object at any moment in time. Now, after this moment, t is equal to zero, all our time intervals uh, are positive, obviously. Preceding this, they will be negative. So we can always say, that for any moment of time, before or after certain conditional beginning, we can define the position of our uh, point or our object. It's basically like we have conditionally decided where is the year number zero. Now, before this year, it was before our uh, current era, and then whatever happened after this, uh, it, that, that's after, basically which we kind of relate to birth of Christ in this particular case. Whatever the, whatever the point zero is, we can always talk about uh, time which follows and time which precedes, positive and negative values of parameter t, and that's how our argument in these three coordinate functions actually constructed. Well, that's it for today. Thanks very much and good luck.